Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us again for our weekly Wednesday afternoon webinar session. Um, this week we're presenting a little more of a focus topic tailored to the nonprofit vertical and, and the, the folks in the nonprofit space here. I know there's a lot happening in their world in the last six weeks to two months. And I think the, the intent here today is just help give you a little bit of what we're seeing out there um, in the technology landscape to help you empower your nonprofit and, and do things in a more efficient manner in, in these trying trying times where everyone is working remotely. Um, so on the agenda here today, we're just going to talk a bit around the the whole concept of of the the Office 365 and Dynamics 365 platforms and and how that can be aligned to help you in in your nonprofit organization and, and just some of the aspects of that. Um, we'll also touch on towards the event, uh, the end just around digital events. I know we're seeing a, by necessity, obviously, in the last little while, a number of people being thrust into presenting and interacting and engaging with people in different fashions uh, over digital channels. So with me on the call here this afternoon, and I'm going to be chiming in throughout on some of this, who um, someone who works pretty closely with the nonprofit space is Charles Buchanan of Technology Helps. So Charles, thanks for joining this afternoon and lending your time and mind share to something that is really helpful for a lot of people. Okay, thanks Luke. So I think one of the, the larger challenges here and, and something even just earlier this week talking with a with a research, a non-for-profit research group that's just getting up and, and running here is, is trying to get a lot of the information in, in the same space and, and utilizing some of the components here. Microsoft has some fantastic products and some fantastic programs in place to support um, nonprofit and charity organizations so that they can take advantage of, of some of these business systems here. And I think one of the big goals is creating some business continuity and in terms of having one director come in do a bunch of wonderful work and putting it in one spot so that it's accessible for some of their peers and some of the staff in those nonprofit organizations but also when they leave or move on to other ventures how can the organization keep that and build upon it and keep the momentum going in the right direction uh, as opposed to just losing that and having a lot of that mind share and knowledge knowledge gap um, when that person leaves. So how do we how do we create a bit of a digital environment? And, and I think what we've seen is Office 365 and the Microsoft platform is a good spot for that, for just getting everyone in the right in the right space collectively together where they've got some tools to collaborate and work together. Um, and the end output obviously is one of business continuity and information continuity, but also uh, increased productivity where people can can interact. I think what we're seeing here just over over some of these digital channels now that everyone is is working from home, uh, perhaps more people have some more time to to put towards things. So um, those are just some of the the trends we're seeing. I don't know, Charles, do you have anything that you've you've noticed in in the last two months in that regard? Well, I no, I think we probably would echo that. So, because what we've seen, we've seen a lot of people trying to work from home, but people are starting to realize the the challenges associated with uh, with having with having things on prem. You know, having servers in the office and not having the ability to to collaborate or work remotely. So, pretty much the same things that you've been seeing, as well as uh, a, a need to connect with constituents and uh, and uh, and clients re remotely and deliver services remotely. Yeah, so what are these pieces we've been alluding to and, and talking about in the Microsoft product set? Um, if you are familiar with some of these pieces here, you, this will sound sound familiar if it's things that you haven't explored yet. Um, these are these are available for for uh, for you and depending on what Microsoft subscriptions you have, I think even up to uh, 10 users of, of business, uh, the Microsoft business subscription. Microsoft is, it will put it in your hands as a nonprofit organization and we'll kind of direct you to some of that information towards the end. But there's kind of four, four to five core components here around this, around the, the outlook, 
and mail experience. So getting an, an online mail service, and, and as Charles said, there's no need to, to manage a mail service. So, so long as you have internet connection, and if you're able to access your email um, from home, from a web browser, or you know, from, a, from a mobile device is, is somewhat something that's of a modern convenience. So setting up the mail as the first piece, what I'll just say is it's listed here as collaborate uh, SharePoint, but maybe I would classify that as more document management and document collaboration. So setting up a SharePoint uh, to function as even a, a company intranet where people can land and say, here's our here's our branded homepage. And then from there we can step into uh, a space, a workspace for for our administration, a workspace for our programs, a workspace for our facilities and a lot of your templates and standard standard organizational documents are set out there with the appropriate branding guidelines and version history and and document structures and controls. So a pretty, pretty useful function and, um, and something that a lot of people have maybe just kind of organically done in in bits and bits and bytes and so on a thumb drive here and someone else's desktop over there without any real top down uh, hierarchical structure. And I think that's something that a lot of people can really benefit from uh, when new people enter the organization where they can just be directed to a, a file structure and, and they can start to explore and, and add their own information. Charles, do you, have you had any good use case experiences with that type of uh, scenario? No, I think I'll just hold on till we go later on in the, in the discussion. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the other aspect here, and I think garnering the most attention today and in, in the world we're in is, is Microsoft Teams. And I know people are springing up Zoom meetings as much as possible to stay connected, to, to engage with people. I know you may hear in my in my background here, my wife has been working from home part-time, but she's a, a fitness, she runs a, a fitness facility. So she's teaching fitness classes over or virtual meetings and, and doing that. A lot of that is, is something that Teams is really becoming very useful for. Uh, even just doing sessions like the one we're on right now is, is something that's it's pretty incredible what's what's possible there and then tying that into um, some chat capability and, and ongoing document collaboration are some some really useful pieces. So I think kind of just expanding on that um, ability to co-author documents is something that we're seeing it's it's something that's really useful and it's been around for quite a while. But uh, if I were to pull up a document, a word file here, and I needed contribution from Charles, we could hop, hop into the same document together, pull it up on the screen. He can be working on you know paragraph one. I can be working on paragraph two, and we don't necessarily need to be in the same space. It's one file. There's no need to manage in terms of version history or anything of that sort. Um, but that's just one one example of a of a quick simple way to uh, to co-author and, and share documentation back and forth. Charles, do you have anything you'd like to add on that? Yep. So like this works really wonderfully. Like where we've seen it, like in the organizations we serve, is around the application for like grant applications, like. Uh, so a grant application usually has components where someone's describing the program, someone's doing the budget, another person's doing the overview of the organization. So we've got, so you have many people working on the same documents and you're, there's never ever a version of the document that's not the most current that would, that's, uh, that's, in, that's in play. So this works one, this has been working really well for the organizations we've, we've been dealing with. Yeah, the long complicated grant applications, hopefully not too complicated, but that's a, a great use case. Yeah. I think over time, one of the other messages here is, is I don't think we want anybody to feel intimidated in terms of needing to do all of this. Uh, as you go through the Microsoft toolkits, just think of think of good use cases like that one that Charles just provided with the the grant writing application scenario and, and just figure out how it can be mapped back and, and make it as simple as possible for people to pick up and, and start to work with. And, and I think one that we're really seeing is, is, I mentioned it earlier, around Teams. So firing up a quick Teams call, 
even if it's something as simple as doing, I know what we've started doing is Friday afternoons, just a bit of a happy hour get together since everybody's dispersed at this point, but um, just getting everyone on the same same virtual space is something that's that's really been useful. Uh, I think some other things around the capability to tie in Microsoft Forms as part of your Office 365 subscription is really useful as well. So setting up surveys and um, creating some discussion forms are really good good aspects to generate some additional interest and ask ask people for their feedback because I think for me it's it's the more people provide feedback, um, you'd be surprised some of the additional information you get on feedback when you ask. Uh, Charles, do you have any thoughts on that? No, I think no, I think that's pretty good. Keep going. Okay. Yeah, yeah a really simple simple example there. Just if you want a practical takeaway, um, as a meeting, an agenda item, as following up of a you know a monthly executive meeting or a monthly board meeting, just a simple five question. Uh, Microsoft using Microsoft Forms doing a sample survey of were all the the items you wanted on the agenda on the agenda if there was something that we didn't cover what is it and and just utilizing that as uh, soliciting feedback just to make sure there's a good pulse of, from everyone in the organization but then using that to generate for additional agenda items for the next meeting um, security I know security is a big a big piece here um, but I guess the the overarching message here is Canadian, uh, it's hosted in Canadian data centers from Microsoft and they've been making that investment at a, at a large, large scale. Uh, I would say a, a scale far beyond many multiples of what all of us on this call together uh, in terms, terms of what we could all collectively do in terms of uh, building cutting edge data cybersecurity built into to your subscription, uh, you're paying for it in your subscription, right? So that's just some of the, the value add and what in terms of what you're getting for uh, email phishing, backup uh, capabilities built into your to your cloud services. Um, I know there's a number of, of simple email phishing attacks and, and the email filtering and spam filtering with with the Microsoft 365 piece becomes stronger and stronger. And there's there's simple little things here like we can actually pop it in the chat later. I'll send around a link to a simple re email reporting add-in to Office 365 to your mail client, where if you get something that's suspect in terms of an email, you can tag it as a phishing phishing attempt, and it's it's blocked permanently, and and that feeds back into Microsoft's algorithm, where I can't even remember the number of different pings per day. Like there's a number of uh, feeding through their their um, their systems. There's like trillions of email transactions and and they're running uh, machine learning on that to to involve and, and advance their cybersecurity. so it's it that's all part of what's baked into your microsoft subscription charles you're a little closer to the cybersecurity side of things perhaps than maybe i would be what should yeah. people be thinking about in this regard there there's a lot to think about around cybersecurity. but one of the things but as people are working at home it's uh the cyber risk has uh, has increased exponentially because, like, typically you get a, you get an odd email. You're sitting next to someone in the office. You might just turn to them and say, "I mean, did you send this?" But right now, there it's very it's highly possible that someone could uh, you could get an email from your boss or what you think is coming from from your boss, and it's uh, or some or, an, or one of your peers, and says you should you know take action on something or click on this or read this, and uh, and you're not they're not right there in the same space. So you just be, you just naturally subscribe to you know, expect that the email actually legitimately came from them. So it, it is, uh, people are more at risk working at home and there are some protections built into Microsoft, but there is a lot that needs, a lot, lot more that needs to be done to, to keep yourself safe. So I think we probably, we may end up having another session where we specifically talk about uh, keep, about cybersecurity and keeping yourself safe, but there's some good, there's, the, there's some good basic security built into the platform. Yeah, and that's really well said. I think that's, the idea is leverage what is built into the platform and more and more is being built in there, but there's certainly elements to think about your, your server aspects and, and securing that in terms of your data center, the mobile devices in terms of who's accessing corporate data there, what your information management policies look like, who has access to, to certain things, but 
things that could be uh, drilled into deeper. Um, just to give you a, a tangible use case here to, to take uh, take away as a, a spot here, the Canadian Cancer Society, they're heavy users of Office 365. Um, but some of the things they've they've noticed in terms of wins, um, I think this is a publicly a Microsoft published case study, so you could probably pull it up if you wanted to uh, in further detail. But I think generally speaking, there's a couple a couple thoughts here. I, I just want to maybe add to this: um, giving people a tool set to to work with your entity, even if that's on a fractional basis, um, particularly people who are contributing in a governance capacity as a as a director or maybe able to volunteer portions of their time, if you can find ways to make it easier for them to engage with you and collaborate and communicate with you and, and share documentation back and forth when they may only be able to contribute a, a portion of their time and, and it's not their full-time endeavor, I think those are the, the wins you're trying to, to see there. So um, this might be a good, a good use case. Obviously, you know, there's a number of Number of charities, nonprofit societies, and, and entities out there. Few are as large as the Canadian Cancer Society, but um, perhaps some lessons learned if you take a look and see what they've been doing. Charles, do you have any thoughts on yeah. that? No, yeah, this is a this is a really good example where you could connect with people, but you could you could literally run an entire virtual organization on Office 365. Like I mean, so I don't know if much people know much about uh, our organization, Technology Helps, but we we. We started off as a, we came out of the nonprofit space, so we've been in a nonprofit organization since uh, early 2016, and we we pretty much run our entire organization on Office 365, Dynamics 365, and a Microsoft stack, and it's possible. And uh, when when we closed our office on March 13th, there was zero impact on uh, on the way we work because we've just uh, because everything's cloud based, all the tools are possible, and almost everything is is doable from your phone. Yeah, that's that's exactly it. And so, how do you start to to approach that? I think there's a number of components here, but really want to impress upon you that it, it doesn't. Rome wasn't built in a day. Uh, they might have been laying bricks every hour, but they didn't do it in a day. So it's tended to be. I think people evolve over time and and grow into pieces. So even if it's as simple as just getting a Teams environment set up so that people can have virtual meetings and screen share, and then trying to figure out how do you structure uh, your documentation and, and let people collaborate and, and work on documents, getting other you know, applications and databases that you have in place there, then figure out and say, okay, well, we have a number of different data sources that we're working with. How do we get all of that in one spot? How do we What's our strategy around marketing and communications? What is our strategy around fundraising and, and grant management? How do we how do we engage or recruit volunteers? And then how do we analyze on some of these pieces? So um, these pieces here just intended to give you some ideas, but the uh, main message, I guess, from our point of view and people we've seen tackle this successfully, they've done it in a series of series of steps and uh, and they've layered technology on over time to help. Charles, do you want to jump in on this? Yeah, yeah so this kind of gives an, an overlay of what's all, all what's possible or or just a little bit of what's possible overall. But you can start off very simply with just uh, as a nonprofit organization or a charity, you can start off with just email management online. Just uh, give everyone, uh, you know, a, an, uh, an organization email address. And then you could move on into just using things like OneDrive to manage your personal files, SharePoint to share your files. Then you could move up throughout the layer. So it's uh, it, the, the roadmap is, uh, you can make the roadmap whatever you want and you could just add the tools and it's all integrated and tied together. It's just really just adding capabilities as you need them. So that's, that's, that's what we're really excited about this platform. Yeah, and it's, it is easier and easier than I, I think in the past in particular, we'll kind of shift gears and, and talk more about this Dynamics 365 aspects. And in the last approximately two years, Microsoft has made some pretty significant and I'll say well thought out investments in terms of their nonprofit accelerator. So really giving you pieces you can pick up and get going with fairly simply and fairly quickly around uh, using a, a structured database platform, a business platform to run, run your organization. 
Uh, and where really a lot of that starts is, I think I might have used this terminology, a single source of truth earlier on with having one, one unified data source. But I think traditionally, one thing we've seen is just having organizations, and this is not specific to nonprofit, this is across every industry, is having so much information that's retained in, in kind of three primary spots. One, on the, on the shoulders and in the heads of all of their staff, which is a great thing, but not when it's the only thing and when those people go to leave the organization or um, they need to, they're really valuable to the entity and how do they get people to join their, join their team and how do they knowledge transfer to others. Uh, their email inbox being the second data source, the third data source being various levels of, of Excel. So those are, if that describes your, your entity today, don't feel bad because that's, that's how everyone, I think, operates to some extent. Charles, you're snickering. You anything yeah, no. you want to add? <laughs> well, it, no, it, it gets beyond that because even organizations that have, that have evolved beyond the Excel spreadsheet for contact management, like, you know, we've, uh, you know, we've worked with over 150 organizations in our four years. And there's, there's quite a few that we've seen where there's, there's silos of information. One organization, they had, uh, they had their donors and they had their audience for the, for their productions they did. And they also had volunteers and those three people did not know each other. And in, and in, in many cases, they were the same people, the people who were funding the organization because they believed in it, they gave money, they attended the shows, and they also volunteered in some of the on committees and uh, fundraising and other kind of events. And yet they, those, uh, those data sets were completely disconnected and uh, they ended up having situations of people tripping over each other where you know, the development manager is talking to, to, a, to a donor about you know, a, minor, a small donation when that donor just came back from lunch with the, with the executive director who just solicited a fairly large donation. So, so that kind of thing could happen. So a single source where you just know what's happening with each, with, with each contact is critical. And I think Lou's going to get more into that now. Yeah, and I'll just say one, one source of truth, but then also managing the activity and managing your touches and being efficient with your with your resources, reaching out to the right people with the right right connected message, and uh, and being somewhat organized in that so that you can have a further further reach and, and make the appropriate ask. Um, I, I think there's a, a, a good a good case study here, and, and I know just working with the, the folks here with kids up front on their ticket management system as part of the broader strategy with having six regional offices across the country, how do you then connect that across multiple regions and say, okay, well, we've been getting uh, donations year over year from these, these types of entities. How do we go and have a national donorship strategy and start to connect that? Um, so that's you know, kind of the next level thinking that can come out of this. And, and when you start to look at everything in one holistic holistic way. So that's that's really what I was alluding to there around deepening the, the relationship of, of constituents and um, just even talking with some of the stuff I do on a, on a nonprofit board um, within, within the rugby association here in town, wanting to, you know, just grow what we're doing and talking to professional fundraisers and, and this whole concept that it was, it was a new term to me and I'm not sure if maybe others on the call had heard it, but segmenting your your relationships into people who've who have donated some years but not last year and then donated last year but not every year and then starting to tailor your messaging to to those you know both groups uh corporate givers and individual givers um so yeah i think that's some of what this nonprofit accelerator allows you to to do and, and be a little more tactile in your messaging and, and kind of shift from a sporadic that ex that perfect example you gave Charles of a few people uh, a few people talking to the same person but no one no one being aware the left proverbial left hand not knowing what the right uh, was doing so I think 
there's some good opportunity there where you can do things like seeing a holistic view of, of past history in terms of donations, past history in terms of uh, touch points and conversations, and then having some foresight and ability to direct where you want to take that relationship next. Anything you'd like to add there, Charles? Yeah. So yeah, I don't know if we're, I'm not sure if we're going to touch on business intelligence and the and the analytics capabilities from from this single from from this data set, but there is a uh, you know the ability to just figure out where your people are coming from. Like and, and you know let's stick you know let's stick with uh, with donor management for now because donor management it, it is it is what drives a lot of organizations. But you know like I mean you could just know who your, where your donors are, what contacts you've had with them, but you could mash that up against. Uh, you know, just a postal code database to say where in the city are your people and uh, are your people where, you know, consistent with, are your, is your money coming from where you're delivering your services or are there parts of the city or parts of the country where you're just not, uh, you're, you're not, you're not soliciting and as well as you could, you could start relating that to, to weather, to events that are happening in the world and, uh, or even the weather, and you could see what works, what works, or what doesn't work. So there's there's huge potential. Like I mean, it's uh, it's going to be really exciting for the next uh, next little while. Those are all great examples. Yeah, I've, um, I think that's first step is is starting to capture it, and then the next step is starting to analyze what what you're measuring, and and then focusing, uh, focusing your efforts more effectively from there. Um, there's some really interesting stuff here, I think, just around the whole concept of managing managing volunteers. So recruitment of volunteers, getting your message out to potential vo volunteer resource groups and people that hey, may have um, the the desire or affinity to to engage with you and in, in your organization, and and then taking them through what I'll just classify as maybe the volunteer life cycle. So giving them the appropriate documentation around onboarding for volunteering, if there's vulnerable sector screening or any uh, required onboarding documentation, security clearances, et cetera, things that they need to know uh, about your organization or even maybe a background screening and, and further information around your entity and your, your group. So, so that that can be done as part of their onboarding uh, process, but then also a lot of uh, capability here around schedule, schedule management, and what I'll just say is schedule management and, and case management in particular. So scheduling, if we have this event and we need this many volunteers, how do we sort through our list of existing volunteers, make the appropriate ask of them, communicate the appropriate schedules and information out to them, and then make sure that we have it properly resourced. Um, there's a lot in here within this volunteer framework that people can leverage for that. On the case management side, um, particular, you know, just there's a number of examples right now with with COVID and Microsoft has got a lot of documentation and information out there around what they're doing for case management and and service support solutions right now with with everyone needing to be socially distant, but yet carry on carry on business as much as, as possible. So a lot of case management uh, scenarios as well are possible where you know that could be something as simple as we were out for this social social outing. I realize this is maybe not timely right now, but we were you know at the park and this is the incident that happened. We've captured it, we've documented it and it's it's in the system and then we're we're triaging that case accordingly and pushing it to the right people. And we're putting the information in the right the right hands to say if it's something I I took a first pass of documenting and then I pass it over to Charles he escalates and further evaluates the case. <clears throat> Charles, do you have any yeah. good volunteer management scenarios or well, things that you're seeing? Yeah, volunteer management is uh, it, it will will be completely will will change a lot in this. And there's some volunteer management systems that a lot of agencies use, but when it comes to the implications for case management now, like there are a lot of organizations that are still using paper case files 
and uh, now with the, and there, there are different people who are involved in you know like I mean there might be some complex uh, some complex individuals you know individuals with complex needs working with more than one person in the organization they might be part or even simple case where they're participating in an employment program they're also participating in uh, in in a, in a job in a you know in an education program and some other pro- social programs for the organization it would be good like this this gives you the ability to just have a single a single source for that information. So if one person has gone out and met with them, instead of review it, sending the case, the file over, or having someone try to access the file, the file is all electronic and available, and avail- and, and securely available only by permission. It's not a public, it's not like a website. It's just, uh, and, and you can enter the information on an iPad, you could enter it from your for short notes on your phone, and, the very, and, within, and immediately, the next person involved dealing with that, uh, that client has access to that information. Uh, kind of shifting gears into one of those next aspects we talked about the the campaign side. Um, I think amplifying every every entity seems to struggle with that in some capacity or another. Uh, just in terms of marketing and communications, getting your information out there in a somewhat automated fashion. I know there are capabilities around the you know the mass marketing mail mail solutions like the Mailchimps of the world. Um, and there are pretty effective ways of doing that, but then I think wanting to tie that back to what we were talking about earlier, just in terms of your, your touches and and figuring out what the the historical interactions you've had with other people might look like. So some, some interesting capabilities there around structuring your campaigns, you may want to, to look at further as well. Do you have any ideas or suggestions for everyone on the campaign side, Charles? No, I think uh, so. With the camp, I mean, the good thing about the campaigns is like there's this. It's 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 fantastic campaign management, and I don't think we'd be able to do it justice in in this session. But like the but for like the integration with uh, with with Outlook and the integration with uh, your you know like just pulling in materials that need to be added for uh, for a distribution. And, and tracking how things are going along the campaign path and, and where things are at. No, it's up. Yeah, we, we might need it. We, we'll wait for questions on that. Mm-hmm, for sure. Uh, last, just kind of shifting gears here a little bit. Now, we have seen a lot of uptick in this area just in terms of people trying to find different ways to interact with their groups, whether that's the, you know, the way they conduct their programs on a day-to-day basis, or linking that and tying that to their campaigns and trying to to build out some some new awareness. Um, but here are two things that you may want to look at for running web presentations and web events similar to this. Or if you do have an annual uh, an annual gala or an annual event or an annual conference of some kind, um, the the swap card or other similar conference products are out there, uh, and they're they're really they're really interesting in the sense I'd never heard the term uh, a hybrid hybrid event, a virtual event uh, up till about two two months ago. but it's something we're seeing more more frequently and and you can see just from that graphic there's there is some AI built into this where i I sign up for the conference virtually and I can pick my my sessions from from the various content agenda just as you would for going to a regular event. And Charles does the same. And based on his profile and my profile, there's a bit of a matchmaking element. And we actually, it populates time in each of our calendars where we could potentially sit down and virtually meet and get to know each other and exchange exchange information further. So I just think that's just kind of interesting innovations that have been happening now that people are forced to work from, from outside the office on a semi-permanent basis. Charles, do you have any thoughts on some of these pieces? No, no, th- yeah, th- I think I think people are going to see a lot more of this, and this is not uh, the the only thing I would say to people. This is not as far out there as it would appear. This is not, these are tools that are available immediately. You want to engage in this, you could just immediately just start taking advantage of this. Yeah, yeah, I think one of those items we're we're trying to to figure out what this looks like right now, and we don't really have everything solidified yet but with last week's announcement of the stampede being cancelled i know we we typically do a 
a bit of a stampede social. So I think what we're going to try to attempt and create a, a little bit of community here around swap using this swap card platform on top of, of what we already utilize to create a, a simulated in-person stampede party. So that's that's the idea and, and just we'll we'll attempt to, to work with some of that. But I guess where to get started on some of these pieces. Uh, I mentioned earlier, Microsoft does provide nonprofits with up to 10 licenses of Microsoft Business subscription for free and heavily, heavily subsidized uh, services across the board. So there are some pieces here um, with, in particular, the Azure resources for, for some of your subscription services. You see that on there as well. That's, that is a, a credit that they give you annually. So I think you might have, if, if you've started to explore this, really the one key piece you need is a, a charitable organization number. And, and the link is there where the Microsoft site is, it's pretty well laid out and, and really helpful in terms of dri driving you to where you need to go to get, uh, get some of that information. Charles, you've helped lots of people with this uh, in terms of getting started with this. What would be some of the best practices and tips you might have? So yeah, first and foremost, you just have to qualify. So you don't have to necessarily be a registered charity. A non it's, it's, it, in Canada, it applies to nonprofit organizations as well. And, uh, and, and you don't, I mean, you, you register with TechSoup to get your Microsoft certification. But once you do register with TechSoup, you're, your order could be fulfilled by any Microsoft partner like Bitac. They can sell, they can uh, sell you the Microsoft SKU. And uh, many organizations don't know who have server, they're, paying, they're buying new servers. You can host up to, I would say three or four servers with the $5,000 a year that Microsoft gives you in Azure hosting credits. Yeah, and I, I know that that's currently, that's something you need to apply for annually. Uh, on the anniversary date of that, but I believe that's changing here. So stay tuned. I guess Microsoft is, yeah. has heard the feedback on that and, and it will become a little less uh, administratively taxing. Yes. Um, some other resources here. Feel free to check out as many of these pieces as possible. Um, we've spun up a little page here just on some of the nonprofit productivity pieces. I actually noticed this this morning. This was on a a mailer. It's something that um, the Calgary United Way here is doing for some hardware. If there are people who have laptops, old devices, things that they want to donate, uh, they're working in conjunction with with United Way to get those in the hands of uh, people in the community as well. So, so I just thought I'd throw that out there as something that was new on my radar. Uh, I'm sure everyone in this in this call has been is familiar with the Calgary Foundation and some of the website, uh, their website and some of the great resources they've been putting out as well. I know there's some some good webinar resources that really walk you through in a step-by-step -step fashion on how to, to make some grant applications if that's something that you're, you're exploring. Uh, Charles, what other good resources should people be looking at? So, so I, I think the, this is a pretty good starting point. Like, I mean, Microsoft, uh, you could uh, like, and they could reach out directly to us at Technology Help. So as we are, I mean, we see ourselves as, as a resource center for information around technology for, for, for charitable organizations. Great. Well, do we have any other questions? If there's folks with questions on the line, feel free to chime in. We'll be happy to, to talk about anything you may have further questions about. If you are interested here next week, we're going to be doing a similar presentation on the Dynamics Business Central piece, which is the accounting aspects of, of the Dynamics 365 platform. So we kind of gave this, this afternoon a, a quick run through conceptually of the components of the nonprofit accelerator in terms of what is, is there for tailored specifically to nonprofits. But if you do want to start to take a bit of a look at the accounting aspects and how that would be, be laid out from a, from a nonprofit perspective as well, that could be part of could be part of your ecosystem over time. So that's that's happening next week. Uh, Charles, any parting thoughts from your vantage point? No, I, no, I, no. I think this was this was a good this was a good uh, introductory session, and I'm um, I expect that a lot of things that uh, a lot of things that we covered here we we did it fairly quickly, but we're we're wide open for you know to explore, ask any questions you want about any specifics, and uh, 
and we, our organization, we th this is how we operate. We live we live all these things. So if you call in and just say yes, could you show me how you do things? I'd be happy to just uh, to just walk you guys through how we operate on a day to day basis in in the office dynamics environment. Yeah, excellent. We Charles really appreciate you joining us this afternoon and and adding some additional context and flavor to to things. I know we spend a lot of time working with with what we work with on the Microsoft product specifically. So sometimes end up a little bit with blinders on and it's good that you can you can join with with your vantage point from the nonprofit world and everything that you guys are doing with with technology helps. So um, very much appreciate it. Oh thank you. Um yeah uh, thanks for having us. Great. Thanks everyone for joining. Have a good afternoon.